So again, um, welcome to the second webinar in our Red Plus Monitoring, Measuring, Reporting and Verification Training the Trainers series. My name is Sarah Carter and I'm representing Goffsey Gold and Wageningen University, two of the organizing partners. This webinar series has been supported by the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility with other support from FAO and GFOI among others. And participants who participate in at least six of the seven webinars in the series, which runs until June, will receive a certificate of participation after the series. So for more information on the series in general and for links to the materials which have been discussed in the webinar, including this webinar, please visit the link um, which you'll see on the slide. You can also contact me using the email address on the slide as well. At the end of the week, the recording of this webinar will be available on our website as well, so you can download and watch it again when you want, and the same will apply for all the other webinars. So firstly, some housekeeping information. Um, this webinar is going to last for around one and a half hours, and first I'll give an introduction to the series, and then we'll have a presentation on the Redplus decision-making support tool from the FCPF, from Alexander Lodge. So, some background on the series. Um, this series aims to help you negotiate the Red Plus MRV process. And along the way, um, we will introduce a number of tools and methodologies which support this process, as you can see from this slide. Um, and there are a lot more tools and methodologies which are available and which could potentially be incorporated into the schematic, but we chose just to focus on the tools which will be presented in this series. The red compass, which you can see in the middle of the slide, helps users to stock take where they are in the red MRV cycle. Um, and it also points towards other tools and methodologies which can be used. So that's why we started last week with the um, webinar in the red Compass, and you can find the recording of this um, already on our website, so please take the time to, to watch that recording if you missed it. Um, there are a number of other tools um, on different uh, aspects of Red Plus MRV, including the design side of the um, MRV process, and also um, some resources such as the World Bank of the Gold training materials to the left of the diagram as well, and the Red Plus source book, as well as the MGD, which are available and useful resources to help you give advice on um, all sorts of aspects related to Red Plus MRV. And they were also covered um, on the last webinar. So please, again, take time to, to watch the recording if you missed it. Um, so on to the webinar series. Um, we are now on the second webinar, which is uh, basically number two in the schematic, and you can also see some of the things which are going to be covered by the, the next webinars. Um, so the third webinar is focusing on activity data, um, the fourth on community-based monitoring, um, the fifth on uh, monitoring forest degradation, and the sixth on uncertainties and accuracy uh, accuracies relating to activity data, and then the, uh, the last webinar will be on national forest monitoring systems, and we'll look at the CEPAL um, cloud computing platform from the FAO. So this slide is something which um, you may recognize from the last webinar, and it gives an overview of some of the Red Plus MRV activities. Um, and the um, the, the four general areas, and also it, it shows you which of the World Bank training modules you can use for each of the uh, components. And today's uh, webinar will be on the World Bank Decision Support Tool, which is also referred to in the Red Compass, um, and covers uh, the policy and design decisions component. Um, so basically you can see where this webinar fits in with the bigger picture which you were introduced to last week. So now uh, back to the main focus of this webinar. Um, first of all you'll see a presentation and then a short video on the tool. Um, you can also post questions um, if you have them related to the presentation in the chat box which you should see on the control panel for the webinar. So please. Um, 
post your questions when you have them and we'll take a two minute break after the presentation to collate those questions and you can also continue um, to write more questions in if you have them and we'll then take your questions. So now on to our presentation, we have Alexander Lotch from the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility. Um, so Alex, uh, I will hand you the floor. Okay, thank you, uh, Sarah, and uh, welcome everyone out there in the world. Um, my name is Alex Lutch. I work with the World Bank uh, Group, and uh, there specifically with the Forest Carbon uh, Partnership Facility. And as uh, Sarah indicated, I will walk you through a tool, which is one of the design tools that you can use in the process of designing your country's or your region's forest monitoring system as well as the uh, measuring and reporting and verification functionality of, of that system. This is a tool that was uh, developed by a number of partners shown here on this uh, starting screen, notably Windrock International and Applied Geo Solutions. And it's presented here, as Sarah said, as part of a set webinar series as one of the decision support tools that would inform the uh, process of forest monitoring system uh, design. Now, uh, to get uh, started, and uh, I suppose we have a mixed audience out there listening uh, to this, uh, some countries um, or participants from countries that are quite advanced in the forest monitoring system, others that may be just uh, starting. So let me say a couple of uh, general points of what we have learned in the context of the FCPF, Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, working with a wide range of countries over the last couple of years, uh, 50 plus countries many of which are at different stages of the development of their forest monitoring system. Now, one observation we've had is that countries are bombarded and inundated with a variety of information regarding to forest monitoring information and data that comes from satellites or airborne uh, observations uh, with different kinds of resolution, different kind of spatial temporal resolution. Uh, they also uh, are, uh, have access to availability uh, and availability of uh, a variety of map and, and data products. And many countries, um, often with partners, are collecting data on the ground. So there has been a proliferation of data and information related, related to forests in, um, in, in the last couple of years, some of which has been promoted by the technical support um, by uh, REPLUS programs like the FCPF or the UN REC program. FAO and, and many bilateral uh, partners. And uh, you're often presented with a, a very confusing picture um, to, uh, to work in this uh, space. Of course, the, the main objective in the context of Red Plus is to reduce emissions from uh, deforestation, forest degradation, deg degradation, Red Plus. You're all familiar with this uh, concept and this term. And the main objective is, of course, to estimate emissions, emissions in the past, uh, in a historical past, but also going forward as a way to monitor these emissions and get compensated for good performance reduction in emissions. And uh, the basic formula shown here is something many of you are probably familiar with, that the emissions, the, the E in the RED plus uh, acronym is basically estimated with two sorts of information, a combination of activity data or measurements of forest cover or forest quality change over time and corresponding emission factors. So estimates and observations of carbon density in these uh, respective uh, forests. So that's the basic formula. You see that almost in every presentation on, on the Red Plus MRB. So no surprise that you see it here as well. And it looks quite simple, uh, but in reality, it's not that simple, and there's many ways in which you can basically implement and apply this, this uh, 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 very formula. You can do this uh, using very basic and simplified approaches, but you can also use very sophisticated and uh, advanced uh, approaches. And the result will be uh, uh, different kinds of quality of emission estimates. So there's many ways uh, to do this, and it can be quite bewildering if you're beginning in this process. And it may not be as simple as it seems, which is perhaps what uh, the teacher of this student told him when he presented uh, his uh, exam results uh, to solve this simple trigonometric problem, which of course is not the solution. 
it's not as simple as it seems sometimes. Um, also, another observation we've had working with many countries is that as experts um, support these countries, all these teams, they all have different opinions and different views how you can solve the problem. And uh, I suppose you can see this slide out there uh, and uh, showing uh, two experts on the left and the right looking at the same problem. And they're both right, if you look very carefully. Um, and you can, you know, diagnose the problem differently depending from the perspective you look at it. And that's also the same when you have experts on R uh, MRV and Red Plus and forest monitoring advice, provide advice to countries that there's many ways to do it and many ways to do it right. Again, a very confusing situation if you're just beginning in this, in this process. And they can left you, leave you confused with respect to what data to choose, with whom to work with, what technology to apply, uh, which guidance material to use, and that was the situation we found ourselves in, in, in a number of countries uh, working through international programs like the FCPF, and we figured we need to provide some support, uh, decision support in this bewildering space. And this was the beginning of what is now presented as part of this webinar series, and as well as the, the training modules that uh, Martin and Carly introduced at last week's uh, webinar. So over the last couple of years, we've developed a number of uh, tools. And when I say tools, of course, I don't mean hammers and uh, uh, screwdrivers, but I mean, I mean software and online and data-driven uh, decision support tools, along with technical guidance uh, material to help countries and technical experts in these countries perform this, the design process of forest monitoring system development in a rigorous and transparent and technically sound uh, fashion. So the combination of tools and technical guidance that you can learn about in this webinar series are all meant to put you, the technical expert, in the driver's seat. Um, so you can make, as people working in countries or for governments or as advisors to governments uh, on, on Red Plus, uh, you can make informed decisions and conduct a technical design process in a, in a, sound, a sound manner. So that's the basic uh, idea behind this tool and, and the whole set of materials that we're presenting to you in this uh, webinar uh, series. We might put you, the technical experts in the country, in the driver's seat. So this uh, background in this context then led to, among other things, the development of the tool that is the main feature of this uh, webinar, which is the tool that we call the FCPF Red Plus Decision Support uh, Toolbox. You see the URL uh, shown here on this slide, so you can go to the uh, forestcarbonpartnership.org uh, website where you find all sorts of information about uh, the programs in this and the countries in, in this program, and then slash DSD, decision support tool, that will get you to, uh, to the tool. And what you will be presented with is an online tool with a simple interface, uh, but behind, behind it you have a comprehensive uh, database. And uh, that tool will allow you to do two things, or it's designed to help you to do uh, two things. One, it helps inform a technical approach for the design of reference level and a forest monitoring system that can measure, report, and help the verification of emissions and emissions reductions in the future. So informing that process. But also, it is meant to help facilitate technical and policy decisions related to these uh, two important topics. So, oftentimes, when we have people work on reference level and MRV, uh, it's, it's technical people. But, it's called, but, but of course, the information and the data that you generate uh, through this work has important policy implications and is used for policy decisions and vice versa, policy makers and people who, for instance, negotiate about Red Plus or have negotiated about Red Plus for their country need to know what capabilities uh, their country's uh, system has and what their data tells us about the, the, the historical past emissions and the likely future emissions in, uh, uh, going forward. So the use of this tool is also meant to facilitate an interaction between people who work more on the policy side of reference level and MRV as well as people who work more on the technical side. So that's why you see a picture of people in, in a workshop uh, together or through a series of uh, decisions that are pertinent to these uh, two topics. So 
informing and facilitating are the principal functions of this decision support tool. Now, uh, I'm obviously showing you a PowerPoint presentation, and hopefully in a moment, as Sarah indicated, uh, I uh, will be showing you a live presentation of the tool, uh, or at least to give you a quick introduction, as well as uh, you will get to see a short video that gives you a sense of how this tool, what it looks like and how it works. Uh, but uh, for the sake of introduction, I have now a couple of screenshots taken from the tool and embedded those in this PowerPoint presentation because the screenshots are a bit small. So apologies uh, in advance for the small font size on the next couple of uh, slides. This is not for you to read each and every slide and each and every word on the next couple of slides, but just to give you an impression of the, uh, of the interface. So here you see two, uh, two screenshots for certain portions of the world from this uh, tool. You sort of, uh, start to recognize the interface with uh, the greenish and grayish um, uh, design features. You will see a sort of a toolbar uh, across the top here on the left uh, picture that allows you to walk through a structured series of decision steps uh, with this tool. And basically what you um, uh, do principally is that as a user, you choose your country or your jurisdiction, your province or district uh, to include in your analysis. And that's uh, the picture shown here on the left. And, uh, and you can select that specific geography to study more closely in terms of what characterizes its emissions in, in the past and other, other land, user, land use features. So it's, it's, very, it's basically explicit and it's very interactive. And uh, I imagine most of you out there are used to similar tools, so it's meant to be quite intuitive and uh, not requiring major technical uh, guidance and instructions to be used. What uh, it also does, it is built on a consistent set of methods uh, and data that sit behind uh, the tool. One of the confusing uh, circumstances that we have or have had in many countries is that we have many different alternative methods and many different alternative data sources available theoretically or in practice to uh, work on emissions in, in your country. And it becomes very difficult if different parts of the country or different uh, countries use different methods and data to then compare uh, emission estimates. So this whole tool is designed in a way to use consistent methods and consistent data across uh, dozens of countries included in this tool to allow for comparison of emissions across different geographies, across different uh, countries. And that's the, that's the main uh, point uh, I wanted to make here the consistency. Now another thing that you will find in the tool is references to pertinent requirements that pertain to RIP plus and RIP plus MRV. So some come from the Climate Change Convention, the Unit C. Some come from, for instance, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facilities Carbon Fund methodological framework. So there's also specific technical design requirements on reference a level, for instance, but also the Verified Carbon Standard has a set of requirements for jurisdictional uh, red uh, plus. And you will find these embedded in the tool in various places. Uh, so what you see on this cron chart here at the bottom are buttons or links that will get you to those respective uh, standards and give you more information about it. So I'm moving my mouse. I'm, I'm, I suppose you can see that as well. So down here at the bottom, of the screen, you can see these uh, these links. The other thing that you see on this uh, screen, and I'll show you this in uh, in person in uh, or live in um, in a moment, is uh, at the end of a design process and a series of simulated decisions, you can come up with uh, first order estimates for a reference level, for instance, for your jurisdiction, and break that down by emissions coming from deforestation in the past or uh, degradation. Again, more details on that in just a, just a moment. The main point here is that many of these pertinence requirements are embedded in the tool, and you have the opportunity to learn more about these requirements. And this is, of course, most important for countries that are just starting this process or still in the middle of, of this design uh, process. One thing I should also mention that since we 
published and released this tool two or three years ago, many countries have gone through this process and quite a few have used this tool and they're quite uh, advanced now. Some quite a few countries that are partners in the Forest Column Partnership Facility have, for instance, submitted national reference levels to the UNFCCC and they have developed reference levels for jurisdictional programs that they hope to uh, have funded by the Forest Carbon Partnerships uh, Carbon Fund, for instance. Yeah, and this is just to uh, stress what I just said. So as you click on one of these tools, these are respective requirements, the so-called criteria and indicators in those standards. This example here is from the FCPF Carbon Fund methodological framework would pop up. So here's another um, screenshot example from this tool. So again, as you see at the top of this uh, slide is um, a, a series of tabs that you would walk through systematically from left uh, to right. And you would make uh, a number of different uh, decisions along the way about what uh, process you want to focus on deforestation, forest degradation, for instance, what kind of pools you would want to include in your carbon accounting for the reference level and in the future for forest monitoring, and, um, and a couple of uh, other choices you have, for instance, the, the forest definition or forest density that you want to uh, analyze. And as you walk through that uh, process, uh, what it spits out at the end is a first order estimate of emissions coming from these uh, different, different sources as shown here in this particular uh, example and the percent contribution they have to the overall emissions. And that's really one of the principal ideas to give you a tool that quite quickly and very intuitively gives you some rigorous first order estimates of your emissions that would help you inform the design process uh, going forward. After you're done, and you can spend you know, 20 minutes or you can spend a whole day uh, with this uh, tool, uh, depending on uh, how many people work with you on this tool or how much discussion you need to have around various decision points. But in any case, at the end of the process, you would have the option to get a summary of all the decisions you made along the way, the simulated decisions that you made along the way, and be able to print out a PDF and record all the decisions and the respective numbers in a PDF form for reference. So you can take that uh, some other place or refer to it back later. And uh, this is, of course, just one, one way of using it. Um, you can always go back and study a different geography or make a different set of assumptions and record those again in a, in a PDF uh, file separately for, for reference and an offline, offline discussion. Now, a bit more information about what you can in fact, study and explore with this uh, tool. You can explore all five Red Plus activities. So you can, of course, look into deforestation in your country. You can look into degradation from timber harvesting. That's one degradation, form of degradation that's included in this tool. You can also look into degradation from fuel, fuel wood collection and use. And you can also look into degradation from forest uh, fires, as well as enhancements. So all five Red Plus activities, and for those of you familiar with the Red Plus, will, will know what they are, what they're listed here, uh, they can be uh, explored. And again, in the back of this are global data sets that provide the basic uh, information and data to drive information related to these uh, activities. So behind it are a number of data sources. Many of those may be familiar to you. They're all integrated behind the scenes. Um, they're static. They were uh, taken as they were published uh, two years ago when this tool was published. So they're not dynamically updated to reflect the most recent data. But uh, nonetheless, they're uh, rather recent and consistent, globally consistent uh, data sources that are integrated into this tool to allow you to estimate emissions. Uh, so of course we have information about forest cover, forest cover change, uh, there are data sets on fires, logging, biomass and biomass harvesting, soil information, 
and also some socioeconomic information such as population that drives uh, some of the, uh, the, the numbers behind the tool. And as I said before, the, these data sources are really used to prompt the user of this tool to make a couple of informed decisions and have these decisions be informed by the actual data. So you don't make these decisions in, an, in a vacuum or in an abstract without knowing anything about your country or your jurisdiction of focus, but you, you have these decisions informed by actual uh, data. And you can explore different options depend, uh, and outcomes uh, depending on the choice of your decisions. So the sources for, for some of that data are shown here. Again, many of the use uh, will be perhaps familiar to you. Of course, we, we draw on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's um, uh, guidance and guidelines. Uh, the default factors, for instance, are being used here. Also from the UNF, uh, UN Food and Agriculture Organization, there's a very a variety of data sets that are maintained and hosted by the FAO. We also pull in information from various research and data initiatives, various satellite-based data products, but also national published national statistics and literature that is um, sitting behind, behind the tool. I'm not going to go into, into great detail here. There's also a manual, a, a documentation that describes in detail all the sources that are dr driving this, uh, this tool. So you can read up on that if you want to. So that's, um, that's pretty cool. No? I, I, uh, I, I, I hear the excitement uh, among the many people that are connected on this uh, webinar uh, to put all of this at your fingertips. Um, it pulls together uh, a number of important decisions on reference level design as well as the design of a forest and monitoring system. It puts at your fingertips a number of global data sets so you don't have to dig around uh, for CDs and poke around on the internet to find data to, to inform your decisions. The pertinent and, and uh, very frequently used data sources already sitting there staged uh, behind the, the tool and can quite conveniently and rapidly inform your decisions and you can repeat the process um, as, uh, as needed. So that's, that's uh, pretty neat, we thought. But the important note is that the tool does not make decisions. You make the decisions. You as a technical advisor or a, as a government official working with your team on, for instance, the national re uh, reference level design, you make these decisions, the technical decisions and the policy decisions. It does not make the decision for you. It just gives you different options and the outcome of different uh, decisions. Also, it does not set the reference level. Of course, you set the reference level. You uh, you do the quantitative work uh, and uh, you review it and submit it to the various bodies, whether that's the UNF Triple C or the FCPF Carbon Fund, and and that's what sort of sets the reference uh, uh, level. So the tool doesn't do that for you; it just helps you in the design uh, process. As Sarah mentioned, this is one of several tools that is most useful at the beginning of this process when you're just beginning to work on the reference level for your country or for your jurisdiction and you still have many questions and you're still confused about the choice of the many choices that you have to make about data and uh, expertise and methodologies uh, and, and so it's just at the beginning of this process and a lot more technical work is required uh, going forward to actually make these decisions and set a, a, a reference level, or submit a reference level to an official body. So it's, it's the starting point. And of course, uh, all of these things, because their policy implications have to follow a, a due process, so only because you have a tool at your fingertips to, to do this in a, sim, a simulated and virtual fashion online, uh, it doesn't mean that that's a substitute for a due process where review and stakeholder consultation in the country. But the tool can help you facilitate that process, uh, process, both the technical work and the decision-making process in the country. And just to end on a lighter note, this tool is not is strictly limited to the use of reference-level design and the design of your phonus monitoring system, and it does not help you to make decisions in much more complicated practical situations in life. 
like in this uh, scenario. Now, now that you've deeply contemplated your basic two options in this scenario, let me uh, point you to um, where you can find this uh, tool and the various materials. Uh, so you can find it principally on the SPF website, which is forcecarbonpartnership.org. And then you have different ways to get there, either slash technical decision support and training materials, which also features the GOTC Gold materials that were introduced at last week's uh, seminar. Uh, there is uh, red training material, uh, force monitoring, that's another way to get there. Or uh, simply slash DST decision support tool and that will get you to the interface where you can log in with your, you can create a user account with your email address and a password that you make up. Very simple. It's, of course, free and easily accessible. Now, um, before I hand it back to uh, Sarah, let me see if I can manage to show you a short uh, video, five minutes, which you can also find on YouTube and embedded in the tool itself that gives you a sense of a perhaps more dynamic and interactive sense of what this tool does and what it feels like. And uh, this will also be a change of pace and a change of voice for the next few minutes. And hopefully the audio will work as I now play this uh, tutorial uh, to you. So ready? Set. The Go. Red Decision Support Toolbox, or Red DST, is an online interactive build their red programs. Developed by the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility and Winrock International, the Red DST is intended to be used by FCPF countries as they consider key design and technical components in their national or subnational red programs. The Red DST provides practical guidance based on existing Red frameworks, including the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Verified Carbon Standards, Jurisdictional and Nested Red Standard, and the Forest Carbon Partnership Facilities Carbon Fund Methodological Framework. Using mapping software and international data sets, this online tool also produces customized, geographically specific estimates of emissions from Red activities to help decision making, including deforestation, forest degradation by timber harvesting, forest degradation by fuel wood collection, and forest degradation by forest fire. By helping countries understand the key technical components of RED program development and what RED activities are the most significant, the RED DST aims to help countries make informed, practical decisions as they design their RED programs. The Red DST is comprised of four modules, Red Design, Reference Levels, National Forest Monitoring Systems, and Reporting and Verification. These modules were designed to be completed in a specific order, starting with the Red Design module. This is because users make key selections and decisions in this first module that impact results in other parts of the Red DST. Thus, Users should navigate through the tool primarily using the next and back buttons at the bottom of each page. It takes about one hour to go through the entire Red DST, although it may take longer for some users since a lot of information is presented and internet speeds vary. Users may always leave and resume progress at a later time. Before commencing, users should familiarize themselves with key navigational and support features of the website. At the bottom of every page, there are a series of blue buttons. The progress button lets you review the decisions you made as you proceed through the red DST. The restart button allows you to return to the home page and begin a new session. If you navigate away from the page or close your browser, return to the page you were last on by clicking the resume button. For an overview of the red DST's modules, click the sitemap button. The methods and data sources used to produce the Red DST's estimates can be accessed by clicking the Methods and Sources button. On some pages, these buttons will appear. By clicking them, a pop-up will appear listing relevant requirements under these Red frameworks. Begin using the Red DST by registering. From the home page, click the Next button to start. Then select an FCPF country. The first step in the Red Design module is to select the scale of your Red program. 
If you choose the subnational local jurisdictions only option, you can customize the location of your RED program by selecting or deselecting jurisdictions. If you need an even finer scale, click the option below the map. Now you are presented with a basic estimate of emissions from all red activities, including all carbon pools and key greenhouse gases. As you proceed with the rest of the red design module, you will be able to decide which activities, carbon pools, and greenhouse gases to include in your red program. On some of the pages in this module, you will also find a customized inputs button at the bottom of the page. This allows you to enter your own data for certain variables if desired. The next module is where you build your reference level. This module includes some additional interactive features and at the end you will be presented with the reference levels for the red activities you selected in the red design module. The last two modules, national forest monitoring systems and reporting and verification do not include any further decisions or selections. They offer some interactive maps, as well as comprehensive information and practical guidance on setting up measurement, reporting, and verification systems under RED. Once all modules are complete, a final summary is provided that includes all the key decisions made and your customized reference levels. Now that you have watched this video tutorial, you should understand what the RED Decision Support Toolbox is and how to use it. The data and estimates provided by this online tool are not accurate enough to directly base a RED program off. Its information and estimates can help countries conceptualize what decisions fit together and where the greatest opportunities for emission reductions might be under a RED program. Great. Uh, thanks, Alex for giving that um, introduction to the tool and for showing the, the webinar, the, sorry, the video. That was really, really helpful. Um, now we're going to just take a two-minute break. We've already had a lot of really interesting questions um, that people have posted, but let's take two minutes where people can post some more questions, um, and, then, um, and then we'll um, continue with the webinar. So speak to you in two minutes. Hello everyone, um, and welcome back to the webinar. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, we, as I said, we had a lot of questions, um, so we'll try and go through as many as we can, um, and if we don't have time to go through your question, you can always send us an email, again, to this email address here, and we'll, we'll try and answer it. Um, so let's go on to the first uh, question. We have Steffi Hakim asking us, um, about the historical reference level that you can use um, in the tool. And Alex, I wonder if you can tell us, is it possible to vary the, the time of the reference level, for example, 10 years or a period of 15 years? Um, is, is it possible to alter that in the tool and to look at the different outcomes? Alex, can you give an answer on that? Yes, um, you can hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that question. And in, in fact, a very um, fundamental question and an important one to ask. Uh, yes, this tool allows you to explore a number of uh, options, of course, uh, with respect to the uh, reference level design. That includes uh, a choice of the beginning and end year and the length uh, of the reference uh, period. It also allows you to choose a number of other things uh, related to the historical reference period. Um, for instance, whether you uh, use a trend-based reference level construction or a straight historical average. Uh, certain standards, like the one of the FCPF Carbon Fund, for instance, requires you to set the reference period on a 10-year basis and to do that on the basis of average historical emissions, so no adjustments or um, trend-based reference level estimates. So you have, you know, within limits, uh, the option to do that within that tool because you may, of course, use it for a variety of different purposes and at very, uh, perhaps at different scales as, as well. So you can explore that and see what the impacts are of changing the reference period length, the beginning and the end, and perhaps a, a different method to uh, construct the reference level. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Alex, for that um, explanation. We have another question from Lawrence Co Connell, a very specific question. Um, and he's asking, are the Global Forest Watch data integrated in the decision support tool? Maybe you can just briefly mention the, the kinds of data. I think you already mentioned a few that are, are available in the tool. Uh, the connection was just a, a bit choppy, uh, but I think the question was, uh, is the Global Forest Watch data integrated into uh, the tool? Um, yeah. I, that was indeed the question. Yeah. The, uh, one, um, one thing I noted in, in passing earlier is that the tool is um, dynamic in the sense that you can explore different design options, uh, but it's static in the sense that we used um, state-of-the-art data uh, two years ago when we finalized the tool. Uh, so, for instance, that includes uh, a number of data sources that are also being used in the Global Forest Watch uh, tool uh, managed by the World Resources Institute in, in collaboration with a number of uh, partners, which is a, a much more dynamic uh, interface that in real time draws on data sources that sit in, in, on, on the Internet somewhere. Our tool is static in the sense that it uses data sets uh, as they existed two years ago. Uh, nonetheless, we think it's, it's, it's viable uh, for the purpose of informing um, initial decisions and uh, key design uh, questions, help answer key design questions countries may have at the beginning of the process. And in fact, oftentimes we point out that to get a complete, more complete picture, the Global Forest Watch tool is, is, a, is a very useful complementary tool to explore your jurisdiction uh, and perhaps explore different periods or different aspects of your jurisdiction that can co complement the information in uh, in the Red Plus uh, Design Decision Support Tool. Okay, good. Thanks, Alex. That's uh, clear. Um, a couple more questions on the the use of the tool. We have uh, Peter who's asking us. Um, for example, will um, this tool be useful if you're doing a Red Plus project under the Voluntary Carbon Standard? Um, and Belinda Morongo is also asking us, for countries that are establishing their own system for Red Plus projects, can this tool also help if they have their own uh, methodologies and approaches in place? So maybe you can just explain what kind of red projects would be uh, apl applicable for use in this tool. The principal focus for this tool is really um, you know, so-called jurisdictional pro programs, not so much projects. So we're talking uh, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of hectares, uh, not, not thousands of, of hectares like you may uh, look into in, in, in the context of a project. So it's really designed for the eventual implementation at the national level. That's why the first layer is, is national uh, choice of, of jurisdictions, uh, selecting a country. And it drills down two uh, levels below the national uh, level, uh, so down to states and, and districts. Uh, it doesn't go any, any further. It uh, unfortunately does also not allow you to um, define your own geographically defined region, uh, but it really needs to be a composite of these administrative uh, units. So that's, that's sort of the extent to which you can explore and drill down uh, with this uh, tool. One of the reasons why we didn't tailor it to, uh, in a way that would allow you to explore projects, perhaps at the, at the district or sub-district level in some countries, is because, because then the data becomes really specific to that jurisdiction and the uncertainties associated with some of these global data sets because it becomes a, a bit uh, too large and it would be perhaps misleading if, the, if, if you applied it at that scale. Uh, but nonetheless, nonetheless we, we make reference, as I said, to the VCS a jurisdictional um, uh, standard and precisely because that's a standard that is also meant to be implemented at that jurisdictional uh, scale. And uh, with respect to Belinda's question, uh, of, of course, this is not a substitute for um, the country's own systems. Uh, it's mainly tailored to countries at either beginning uh, the design process of a force monitoring system or for the first time consider uh, setting a reference level, submitting that internationally. Um, uh, so it's, it's no substitute for, for countries that have their own systems or have gone through that, that process, but it's most useful for countries that are either exploring a new part of their country, a new jurisdiction, or countries that are at the, at the very beginning of the process and 
need to make some informed decisions uh, early on and design a process um, go, going 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 forward. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, we have a question from Merceline Ojwala who's asking, is the tool open source? And maybe um, now would be a good time to do a kind of practical run through of the tool, Alex, um, if, if that's okay with you. Uh, sh sure. Um, okay, um, so um, I'll, I'll just pass you the screen again. Screen, okay. So um, you should probably see the, the tool now. Uh, what well, now? You should be able to see it. Um, as it's um, live on the, on the, on the internet. Um, but with respect to the question on open source, it's, it's not open source. Um, uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, well, the principal reason, I suppose, it is because what you see here at the top and what you saw in the video and in my screenshots earlier are really tabs that reflect a series of structured uh, decisions, um, and some of them are hierarchical. And to some extent, you have to follow that in, in a sequential uh, fashion. Um, and there's some, some cascading of decisions that happens in, in that tool or more generally in the design process for, for reference level. And uh, so we had to hardwire certain aspects and we couldn't make it uh, all that um, all that flexible and make it uh, open source. Um, what is of course documented well, and again the video made reference to that, are the data sources behind it and the basic methods that are being applied and the assumptions that are being made as you walk through that, uh, through that tool. So, um, so it's not open source. And what I just said is, is, is one of the reasons for that. Also, we, we don't m want to make this sort of an, uh, an ongoing project for, for many years uh, and have this tool grow into something much more sophisticated as, as it is now. We think it, it's more, you know, quite useful for the several dozen countries that are working on these topics um, and making too many changes uh, may be just uh, confusing. But uh, just to walk you through um, a couple of elements then of this tool. Let me see. I can get the control bar out of the way here. So, um, so here you see the basic uh, uh, interface. Uh, you see that I logged in earlier. Uh, you, you can create your own login uh, now. Um, uh, you may be doing this as as we speak. You will see that there's you know hyperlinks uh, to in the text, in the descriptions, for instance, taking you to different um, documents like uh, this document that gives you background on the data and methods in, uh, behind the tool. Uh, I'm going back to the tool now. And the basic way to navigate through the tool is through these tabs uh, up, up, uh, up here. This is uh, perhaps a process familiar to you from, from other sort of internet or online applications. Uh, so this is the landing page, and at the bottom of which, and let me just quickly point this out here, you can also watch the video again that I showed you earlier. It's embedded in the tool. I should also mention, uh, just to save you some frustration in the future, that it's best to run this tool on Google Chrome or uh, Firefox. Internet Explorer has uh, issues with uh, some of the color schemes, so you may not see what you expect to see, so uh, let me just stress that here so you can say me or others uh, technical questions later on when you use the tool. Use these one of these two browsers. Browsers. Also, um, and apologies to, to those uh, who may prefer to listen to this webinar in, in uh, Spanish or French or any other language, um, that we need to do this in, in English, but uh, if you want to watch the video, you can also look at a Spanish and a French uh, version, so maybe that's uh, helpful for those in, in the, the respective countries. The interface is not very text heavy. It's in English, but it's not very uh, text heavy. So hopefully, where well, most most users can can work through um, uh, through the tool with uh, with the, the text that's that's shown here. So very quickly here. Um, just to see how you how, how you can get started, you start with a red plus design, the first uh, tab that gets you to this um, module, and it uh, shows you some of the basic decisions that you can uh, make in a little scheme here. Uh, you make decision on whether you work at the national sub national level, 
uh, what kind of force definition, canopy density you want to use for your estimates. It then takes you further into other choices of uh, what kind of red plus activities you want to include, deforestation, and any of, any of the other four red plus activities, choice of carbon pools, gases, um, and inclusion of managed uh, or unmanaged lands. So these are some decision points that are introduced right here at the beginning. And then again, uh, the main way to navigate through the tool is to use the next uh, button here at the bottom of each slide. So one of the first um, choices you have to make is you know, at what scale you're going to work. Again, it explains what that all means. And again, embedded hyperlinks that show you or get you to more information or backgrounds on, on that. So for now, let me just say uh, I want to work on a subnational level and focus on a particular jurisdiction. I go to the next screen, and here um, you see that there's a map interface built into this. Uh, so here I just picked um, um, earlier, I picked uh, Sudan, and within Sudan, I can now pick different. Uh, I'm not even sure what they're called in Sudan, maybe uh, states or districts or, or provinces, but uh, the, le the administrative level be, um, below national. The na their names are shown here. You can also eliminate them um, by clicking on these boxes rather than on, on the map. And again, you just move on to the next tab, and as you see up here, you may just see the colors change after you change the scale and you pick the jurisdiction, you're now taking into a series of choices with respect to the inclusion of different uh, activities. And they're grayed out here because we haven't made these decisions yet, so the next couple of sub-tabs will walk you through these decisions. And then so on and so forth for pools and unmanaged lands, and you will get the summary. And all of this is, of course, under the design of the program, so the ge geographic uh, scope of the program, the, the activities within the program, and then the next main activity for you to perform is to make a series of decisions on, on reference uh, levels. So I'm not going to walk you through uh, all of this in great detail. I just wanted to give you a, um, a quick sense of what this uh, looks like and how it might work. And again, uh, it's, it's meant to be quite intuitive and um, and uh, fail proof, and as long as you use one of these two browsers that I pointed out, uh, uh, one thing, uh, one last thing maybe I'll, I'll show at this point is that before you make uh, any of these decisions, it give you some forced order estimates, and these are then subsequently refined as you make decisions, make certain choices. For each of those, you will find these hyperlinked uh, footnotes. Uh, if you click on them, it will tell you where the data comes from. So here it tells you that uh, as, a, as a quick and dirty estimate, the activity data one was ta um, uh, taken from Ed Hansen's uh, global data set of uh, forest loss and uh, biomass densities uh, um, from uh, Sasan Sachi's uh, publication a couple of years ago. And similarly for, for other things, you, you will find these hyperlinked uh, footnotes uh, through, throughout these tables that get you to the to the source and the respective publication. And then some of the, the key assumptions are shown here. And again, this is just you know, a quick and dirty way of generating a number. And now, as you walk through the tool, these numbers would be modified and uh, adjusted depending on your choices, depending on what kind of degradation you want to include um, or exclude what gases you want to account for, uh, and so on and so forth. And at the end, and this is not going to work now because I'm not going to make all these decisions for uh, South Sudan now, but you would be presented with a summary of, of your design before you then move into the reference level. Let me just uh, quickly click on this. Um, now it will not carry all the um, decisions forward but uh, just to give you an impression of um, how, um, how this module part of the tool might work. So it gives you some information about how reference levels can be constructed either on a historical average basis or on a trend basis. Um, gives you these options. Uh, you will also find 
uh, which is shown shown here. Uh, this is response a bit to the question uh, shown earlier, so that you can cho choose a different length and start an end date for the period of your reference level. Uh, this is what you would be doing here. You st uh, well, it's obviously confined within the limits of the data sources that we have, so but basically between 2001 and 2012. Um, And here it shows you um, how you pull in other emissions, for instance, from fires, and the uh, the equations that would be used to estimate uh, any trend if you choose to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll perhaps uh, stop here and uh, just end by saying that again, that the main way to navigate through this tool is by sort of systematically walking from left to uh, to right in this in this tool. You're prompted with a number of decision points that you have to make irrespective of whether you do this with this tool or without this tool. These are the main decision points that you presented when you work on a reference level. This is just a, a very structured way and data-driven way to inform that process. And, um, and, you will present, and you will have the option to print out a summary so you can take this to people offline. Let me also say that uh, you can use this tool by yourself um, sitting in your office, exploring different things. You can use this tool as a facilitator of a workshop who has, for instance, your national negotiation team in the room. You can do this as a technical advisor with a group of people. You can do this once, you can do this uh, multiple times. The tool is really meant to be flexible and supporting the design and decision-making process in, in countries. It's also designed in a way to be relatively lightweight in the sense that it does require a lot of bandwidth. So if you're constrained by in, in, internet uh, bandwidth or speed, it should even still work when, when that is not particularly fast. So it's not very heavy uh, in, in that sense that like some, some of the other applications. Um, so there's many ways to use it. Uh, the main point is we want you to use it and it's, it's there for you to be uh, uh, using it. So feel encouraged to use it yourself, tell others about it, and, um, and start playing with it. If you have questions about it, um, ask us. So with that, uh, Sarah, maybe back to you and perhaps more, more questions. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so we do have some more questions for you, Alex. Um, first of all, Himlal uh, Schrenta is asking um, if it's possible to put reference levels earlier than 2000. And I think you already answered that, that there's a limitation with the, the data there. But in case you have anything else to add, you can also add it. And uh, he's also asking, is it possible to insert your own spatial data into the tool? We saw that there's a lot of data sets already integrated, but can users put their own in? Um, on, on that question, um, we consider that it would have required a significant amount of uh, work to make the tool that flexible to uh, allow people to insert different kind of spatial data sets. So you can cannot, uh, but um, and I think the video showed it, but you have a number of different options to sort of customize uh, the tool in a way to use your own data. So you can, for instance, override the emission factor values that are uh, used and pulled out of the IPCC. So if you have that, you can pull that in. Uh, you can play around with the forest uh, cover canopy density, and there's other uh, other variables. Again, the tool and the manual will will uh, uh, point you to those. But um, what would have been too complicated is for you to insert actual uh, spatial uh, data in instead. And again, uh, this goes along with the, the main purpose of this tool, which is meant to kickstart the process and facilitate the process. It's not a substitute for the actual processing of your own data and analysis of your own data uh, to construct the actual reference level. So it, it does not set the reference level, it does not design the reference level, it's, it's meant to facilitate decisions and get people up to speed uh, early on. Uh, that uh, was one question. I uh, Was there another part to that question, Sarah? Help me out. Um, the reference level uh, before 2000, can, it, can people set the reference level to before 2000? Okay, yeah, I know you cannot. So as I just yep. pointed out in my quick demo, uh, 2001 is the start year um, and 2012 is the end year, the maximum end year. So you can play around within that 13-year 
uh, period, but not going go before 2000. Simply, we didn't have the kinds of data sets um, available before that time. It's driven by the um, availability of underlying satellite uh, sources. And uh, more recent um, inclusion of more recent data would require us to update the tool, which is perhaps something we might do in the next uh, few years. But for now, we end in 2012. Okay, great. Thanks uh, for that answer. I think we just have time for two more questions. Um, so, firstly, Alex, another question um, is uh, asked by Hani Shalabi, um, and they are asking, what does this tool do that the FAO X Act tool doesn't do, and um, would one be useful for certain activities, the other for other activities. Maybe you could just uh, comment a bit on the differences between those two to tools. Yeah, thank you for that uh, question as well. And again, it gets me back to some of the earlier points that Sarah made at the beginning of this webinar. And I'm, sh I'm sure she will be making the same points at that uh, subsequent uh, webinars that we'll have over the next few weeks and months. Uh, there's really sort of a, a toolbox of, of tools out there if you want. What I presented today, the decision support tool, is, is one of several tools. Uh, they're all relatively user-friendly and, and, and light, uh, lightweight. In many ways, they complement each other quite, quite well. I made the reference to the Global Forest Watch earlier, uh, which is another complementary tool that one of the key advantages is that it can pull in other online data with perhaps more recent information and additional information. And uh, one of the other tools is the one that there was the question about is the FAO exact tool. Um, that uh, perhaps is much more tailored towards uh, project-based analysis um, before implementation. So it's an ex ante um, a tool to estimate emission, the impact of emissions, uh, the impact of a project on emissions. So you can explore different scenarios of uh, how the uh, a project, for instance, a land use project or a livestock project, would impact emissions in a particular project area. It's perhaps also tailored more towards you know, projects as opposed to programs at the jurisdictional or national uh, level. Uh, but it also pulls in you know, very similar information, such as IPCC default uh, values. But the purpose is you know, somewhat different uh, in the sense that it focuses perhaps a bit more on project design and the ex ante, the um, estimation of emission reduction potentials that you have uh, with a um, considered uh, a project. And it, of course, it doesn't help you set, set the reference level and uh, provide information on the force monitoring the system design, which is something very red plus specific. FAO exact is not necessarily um, red plus specific, but it focuses much more on emissions more generally in the land use space. Okay, great. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think we just have time for one more question. Um, so, perhaps, Alex, you can tell us a bit more about how this tool is, is actually used in practice. We saw a picture in your presentation of a, a workshop, maybe people using the tool or training on the tool. So, maybe you can give um, some examples of countries that are really using this tool and what they use it for and what kind of context they're using it as well. So, anyone can use it. Um, it's, it's out there uh, on the internet. Uh, anyone can log in. It's for free. Um, many have used it uh, just by themselves to explore a certain jurisdiction. Um, we, colleagues at the World Bank, that is, as well as other technical partners like those at FAO, are using it when we travel to countries to, uh, to support them uh, in this uh, process of designing a reference level. Um, the idea is really to empower uh, experts and advisors in countries to use it um, and make these decisions themselves. As I meant, uh, said earlier, that this and other tools are meant to put the drivers, uh, the, the experts in the country in the driver's seat uh, and not have the international experts do that. So oftentimes we provide an introduction to these experts in the country and they take it from this point on. We have used it in workshop uh, settings where we again bring together technical experts and policy experts and work together through a series of policy and technical decisions so everyone is on the same page, um, proverbially speaking, and, and everyone understands the, the limitations and the opportunities um, in, in, in that respect. Um, we have used it in regional workshops to train people 
that provide capacity building and technical support to, to countries um, with the idea that they would use that in, in their own work uh, going forward and, and multiply the, the, the use of this and other tools as well. So there's many ways in which you can uh, use it um, individually as a group, uh, as a diverse group, as a technical advisor. It's, it's not very heavy on technical things. Uh, it's, it's meant to be quite intuitive even for those who are not deeply familiar with, for instance, IPCC good practice guidance. They can sort of intuitively um, understand and work through these uh, series of decisions. So, so there's many ways to do it. and uh, the, the, one of the main objectives of the seminars was, of course, to introduce this to a lot more people out there in, with the hope that you use it and use it constructively to inform the process in your country or in your jurisdiction. Sarah, back to you then. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think that's about all we have time for. Um, so thank you, everyone, for participating in the webinar. And Alex, thanks for giving uh, a very interesting presentation and demonstration of uh, the Decision Support Toolbox. Um, so we hope to see everyone uh, for the next webinar, which will be um, Tuesday, the 9th of May, um, and it's going to be one hour later than the start time for this webinar. Um, you can sign up on our website um, for the next webinars, um, and you can also find the links to access the tools which were presented in this webinar. So please take a look at our website and, and hope to see you in two weeks for the next webinar. Thanks, everyone.